Greetings to everyone. Um, I am so delighted and excited to be able to introduce our guest artist today. The great singers come and go, the innovative stage directors come and go, and conductors come and go. But it's the things and the people that are constant and a foundation for any opera house are the orchestra and chorus. They are the heart and soul of opera. Thrilling audiences with more than 200 performances each season, the Met Orchestra is one of the world's great performing ensembles, both on stage and in the opera pit. Since its founding in 1883, the Met Orchestra's performances have encompassed not only the entire opera repertoire, but symphonic and chamber programs at Carnegie Hall, international tours, and countless musician activities outside of the Metropolitan Opera House. The Met Orchestra has grown in the past four decades into an ensemble noted by singers, critics, conductors, and audiences as one of today's most stylistically versatile and musically satisfying orchestras. So on behalf of the Library of Congress, I am delighted to present you today to the musicians who are joining us to share with us their insights and perspectives on their upcoming program. We have Mary Hammam, viola, Sylvia Volpe, associate principal second violin, Tamara Mumford, mezzo-soprano and guest soloist, and finally Jerry Grossman, principal cello, um, who will be performing. And then we also have with us today Julia Bruskin, who is also a cello um, member of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So before we talk about the program you will be performing, um, I would like to discuss some of the activities your organization and 501c3 has been involved in. Um, so could you tell our listeners how the Met Orchestra Musicians was founded and a bit about the history of it? Sure, I can I can speak about that a bit. So, I mean, um, in normal times, our orchestra works through the Met, Met Opera and um, participates in all of their productions, as well as doing some independent um, performances at Carnegie Hall or on tours. Um, but for, for all of us to produce our own performances is a very new thing. Um, this pandemic is certainly... Um, put everyone's lives upside down, especially in the performing arts. And I think um, has given us, you know, has challenged us to adapt and find new ways to, to be able to continue to keep the music going and stay in touch with our audiences. Um, I think for me personally, and, and from talking to colleagues for a lot of us, um, the hardest thing about this pandemic, well, no, there are many hard things about this pandemic, but it's been extraordinarily challenging to be disconnected from our identity as artists, as performers, as communicators. Um, and, um, you know, I, I feel it's really important to get back into the act of performing and to find ways to do that. And um, we've, um, you know, we started in those first months of the pandemic, just people playing in their living rooms and, and posting things on social media. Um, as we've gotten further into this and testing has improved and access to certain safety protocols, we've been able to do more and more performances of musicians actually together in a room. And that's been a really wonderful thing to come back to that. Um, the virtual layered things can be can be exciting and, and fun to put together, but it's what we really do is to play together in a way that we can hear each other, that our sounds can blend together and that we can react to each other and, and being able to do that both for our orchestras. Um, what we've created is a Met Orchestra Spotlight series that kind of shows members of the orchestra playing in small ensembles along with some singers when we can. Um, to be able to do these performances that are, you know, all, all of our players together again with their sounds blending in 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 actual acoustic is really wonderful and, and been a very fulfilling thing. Um, um, I should back up a little bit to say that um, as the pandemic began, we were all furloughed from the Met um, and without pay. So it's um, the primary goal, I would say, of our Met Orchestra Musicians Fund has been fundraising um, to support our members. It's over 150 members of the orchestra, associate musicians, librarians, and music staff through need-based grants. And I'm extremely proud of all of our colleagues for the work they've done to create an organization when there was not one before to... to um, you know, all the jump through all the legal hoops to make um, a 501c3 that that can fundraise and um, and be able to offer this service to our members and all those who work with us um, during this extremely long closure of the Met. I mean, it's um, we'll be at a minimum, I think, 17 months that will be away as they're scheduled to open right now in September. We all hope that will happen, but it could stretch even longer. And so I think. Um, the efforts of this fund to to both support our musicians, keep the orchestra together by giving them, you know, um, 
and some support um, so that they won't leave this field entirely, but also to get our players back together, playing together for our audiences. Um, it's a very, it's a big goal, but one that's been really um, gratifying and, and exciting to work on. Great, wonderful. So, so I'm curious, what is, I mean, for each of you, maybe individually, what has been the most rewarding, um, what's been the, the most rewarding aspect about starting this uh, new 501c3? What has, yeah, what have been like, what has sort of surprised you about uh, starting it? That's kind of something that's been very rewarding. I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, a lot of the hard work has been done by people like Julia in terms of creating it, but I think the sense that we can help ourselves and we can um, still feel like musicians and still feel like, and feel as if we can look after one another during this challenging time and maintain a, a core sense of togetherness that that's meaningful because as time goes on, you know, we start to feel less and less like that part of ourselves, which is some someone we've been since we were children. You know, many of us start when we're very young and we're musicians all, the way through to the middle. It's not something we put on as a nine to five. And to be able to access that feeling again emotionally for me has been very beneficial. It's been extremely challenging to be away from um, our work and our audiences. And we do it so deeply and, and, um, and with such difficult hours and with such dedication when we do it that to have it abruptly be gone is very challenging. So I think that that's, for me at least, the sense of identity and that we're attempting to persevere during this time and during this closure has been really important. And I would also say that, um, is, is my sound okay? I would also say that part of being a musician and part of why you do it is you're compelled to share. And not being able to share what our talents has been, I think that's the most difficult for all of us. And to then be able to sit in the middle of harmony, that's wonderful. <laughs> that is such a change that we brought about with Julie's help and our members help to be able to sit and play again together mm -hmm. is so significant as a musician. And I think that anybody who shares, whose job is to share their inner life has been, uh, this pandemic has been very, very hard. I mean, just uh, if you're a restaurant worker, if you're a chef, that's what you, you are compelled to share your talent. And I think there is this similarity between all of us that share our talents that has been, we've been muted and to get together and, and realize, hey, we're still alive. We're still here. We're still doing it. We still need to do this in spite of everything has been really, really gratifying for everybody involved, I think. Yeah. Well, you've made some wonderful video concert recordings and some very innovative collaborations with international opera stars such as Angela Giorgiu. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, do you have any plans to make recordings in this new configuration or do you have any, let's say, any upcoming projects you would like to mention? Um, well, it certainly has been exciting to see how our Met Orchestra Spotlight series has grown and some of the opportunities we've already found with it. Um, I mean, the sky's the limit. We'd love to record. We'd love to to do all kinds of projects. And I think um, if if COVID and this time of the pandemic has taught us anything, it's it's to be creative and find what can work and pursue it. And you know, yeah. um, oh sorry, I just got hurt. Um, that that um, things that we never would have dreamed of before are possible. Um, so I think you know we we don't have a. a concrete plan to make recordings yet, but I would I would totally leave it on the table. Certainly we've talked about chamber music series and performing for a series like the Library of Congress is really meaningful to us in this time. And we really appreciate you presenting the Met Orchestra musicians in this way. Yeah. Well, one thing I can say for sure is that this new 501c3, an organization you have, have created, is what, allow, is what has allowed us um, well, obviously it's clear it's allowed all of you to explore other musical pursuits and passions, but it's also allowed us to have you on our concert series and a wonderful program you created entitled Quartet at the Opera. Um, so on this program, uh, you will be performing Mozart's clarinet quintet, uh, uh, Giacomo Puccini's Chrysanthemum, Barbara's Dover Beach, and Verdi's string quartet. And so, uh, 
one thing that to me is so interesting about the program you have created and just putting Barber to the side at a moment is that this program is really about playing chamber works written by composers whose operas you are so deeply familiar with, like Verdi and Puccini and Mozart, of course. How would you say your specialized knowledge and experience with particular opera composers like Verdi and Puccini, how does that, inf how does that inform the chamber performances you've recorded for our viewers? Um, I, I would sort of think that certainly the idea of vocal line and the concept of vocal legato must be in your inner ear always. I'd say it's more than in our inner ear. It's like wedged in our heart. <laughs> it, it doesn't, I, I never played a lot of opera before I got the Met job. And I remember very, very clearly playing the overture to Meistersinger, which I had played a lot of times before orchestrally mm -hmm. with this orchestra and realizing, oh my God, they know the whole piece. Yeah. And I think that when we play the Puccini Quartet and the Verdi Quartet, there is that that's happening. You know, that all these years of, of that kind of playing, that kind of passion, that kind of listening, that kind of um, uh, adherence to the human voice, that's all there when we play this repertoire. I would add, you know, I came up like you, Mary, I started as a chamber musician and I did nothing but until my mid thirties. And then um, I had a, a brief stint in the Chicago Symphony and the very first piece we rehearsed when I got there was that overture to Meistersinger with Schulte conducting. And of course I was overwhelmed by the sound of the, the, the the great Chicago Symphony and that little hall at the orchestra hall. But again, I had no idea <laughs> what it really was until I got to the Met. And then the whole universe of opera, which I had been sort of exposed to a little bit, but it it just expanded everything, you know, everything just opened up. I mean, into this humongous arena of sound and voices and emotion and you know possibilities and different ways of doing things as opposed to the kind of narrow we chamber music types tend to you know look at the score and get obsessed about whether a note has a dot on it or whether a slur goes here and there and and a lot of all those little little fine points uh, get lost in the wash of this huge sound that we make at the opera it took me a while to get used to that. But on the whole, I would say that just this tremendous, the scale of it all is just so huge and so powerfully affecting. Not that chamber music isn't powerfully affecting, but it's, it's a more introspective kind of experience. And, and when you're at the opera, it's hard on the sleeve all the way. And uh, there's no other place you can have that experience, I don't think, in my experience. And I've done, I've been around the musical block a few times. <laughs> I, I would like to expand on that because um, the works, the operatic works are obviously hours long, right? And so it's when you immerse yourself in a composer's mind for that long, it's more like a marriage, you know what I mean? And, and chamber works, and they're, they're very difficult, and there's so many of them, but they're, they're so much shorter. It's kind of more like serious dating, you know? <laughs> In terms of getting into somebody's mind, I don't mean the experience of learning music, it's just as difficult, but you, you're totally immersed in someone's personality for hours and their intellect. It's, you know, when you do many, many works by someone, you've got a giant body of information about how this person thinks, treats different musical situations, you know, their sense of urgency or scope and scale. And architecturally speaking, it's so different than a chamber work that if we, you know, step into a Puccini quartet, you're like, there he is. I know all about him, you know, and you get a sense, you know, kind of what he would want and what it reminds you of and everything else. I just feel like it, you already have a very good portrait of somebody's mind when you've played their pieces operatically speaking. And really what we do as musicians is try, if we're an instrumentalist, we try to imitate the human voice, period. That's what we're all doing. Mm -hmm. And I think you hear so much at such a high quality every night when you're in the pit, that, that affects you so much as a, as a musician and as a player. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I've read, uh, just speaking about Verdi, you know, I read that Verdi, that he studied the quartets of, of course, of Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven. And I'm curious, um, what kind of influences do you see in terms of composition and the string writing? 
Sure. Well, Verity's string quartet almost sounds like a contradiction in terms because Verity, you know, he's so known for his operas and um, and wrote predominantly vocal music throughout his life. Um, he wrote only a very few um, solely instrumental works, and this quartet is one of them. Um, he wrote it kind of right at the peak of his career, right um, when he was right after Aida um, and before some of his last great works, and um, he wrote it. Um, in a very short span of time at a sort of a, a pause in rehearsals of a production of Aida. Um, the, the soprano who was leading the production was ill and they had to delay the opening a few weeks. And so he was kind of holed up in his hotel room, a little bored perhaps, and said, I guess I'll write a string quartet, perhaps to prove that he could or because I, it's hard to know why exactly, but he decided to do it. And clearly in this quartet, his his own musical personality and all of the elements that make his operas great are present. Um, all that theatricality and drama and passion is there, but but it is um, um, clear that he knew also the, the quartet um, literature that, that preceded him and was aware of it. It, it follows the forms of a quartet um, mm -hmm. fairly closely with a, you know, exposition and a sonata form and then um, these kinds of things. But you definitely hear, you know, um, in the middle of the third movement, feels like it could be a tenor aria the cello is playing with some nice plucked accompaniment. Oh, yeah. it could have come yeah. from an opera. Or, yeah. um, and then in the last movement, he um, is showing off that he knows how to write a fugue and that he could do counterpoint. Um, it's not, it doesn't really feel Beethovenian exactly, but certainly ending a quartet with a big fugue, you have to think that he knew about Beethoven was thinking of that. Um, I, I read that he, he said after writing it, I don't know whether the quartet is beautiful or ugly, but I do know that it is a quartet. And I think certainly it has all the elements that, that you know, that make up a quartet and yet feels entirely Verdi-like, so. Yeah, that's very true. It does sound very much like Verdi. And I'm curious, um, I mean, you know, from, from maybe your work on it or having heard it, of course, are there any direct connections or familiar similarities to the music of um, his operas to the music in the quartet? Well, yeah, like you mentioned, like the third movement, but like, are, are there any other places? Like, like, yeah, like, like, yeah, like you know, you mentioned like the the, the fugue, and like to me, there are some reminiscences of like kind of Falstaff in there. So you get, yeah, the, yeah, like you know, he already kind of had Falstaff maybe in his mind somehow, or some sort of situation that he put in the quartet, and then maybe twenty years later thought, oh, I wrote a double fugue twenty years ago. Let me use that. I don't know, it's, it's funny to think about those sort of connections. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's an actual quotation within the quartet, but certainly it feels to me like he's working out, you know, he's, he's sort of delving into the string writing in a way that he will definitely shows up in false. It feels very much stylistically and, and kind of in the feel of that last movement, like what he what he's, you know, it's kind of an idea germinating in his head that will become that ending of false staff, which is so great. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've always felt about the Verdi Quartet, well, for a couple of things, it's very difficult. And it's an E major, am I right? It's, it's like it, it's all everything's in the cracks technically, and it's very distracting when you're trying to to make something beautiful musically. But I, I've always felt that, it, except for that tenor aria for the cello in the in the, the, the trio of the scherzo, uh, I've always fe felt that it was Verdi's attempt to show the world, perhaps, that hey, I'm not just an opera guy; I can write. A string quartet. Listen to this, and it's purely instrumental music. I, I don't find it as vocal as I think people might expect. Hearing that it's by Verdi, it sounds very instrumental to me. Um, but anyway, my opinion. I, I'll just jump in and, and say that I'm not actually going to play the Verdi quartet. Um, our other principal cellist. No, Rob, I'm not playing Rob, it either. Where, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wonderful cellist will play it. He's played it quite a lot and, and knows it inside yeah. out. But he had his first, his second vaccine shot yesterday and it's not Yay. feeling very well. So oh, we're very, very happy for him and I'm filling in to speak. I about get mine right next week. I can't wait. Okay. Oh, by the way, that's an interesting thing. You know, I, I've been kind of, you know, quite isolated here in my house with my family, doing as little as possible. And then I got my first shot the other day and I feel quite a bit more confident going out into the world and I was able to say yes to getting together with my colleagues and recording the Mozart Quintet. And I just want to say that uh, it occurs to me that what I've missed as much as anything during this terrible time is 
the companionship of my colleagues whom I really, really love. And the knowledge, you know, walking away, I, I joked during the session, I, you know, we had one take that was went quite well and I joked, gee, not bad for a bunch of orchestra players. And the, the truth is, we're not a bunch of orchestra players, we are a bunch of musicians. And I'm always proud of my colleagues, whenever I sit down and, and play chamber music with them in any context, uh, it's like, wow, what a great bunch of people. What a great bunch of musicians that I get to work with. And I've missed you all terribly during this time. And I can't wait, now that I'm feeling a little more confident about uh, my safety out in the world, I can't wait to do more of what we just did. And I hope that uh, you'll ask me to. Yeah, I second that, Jerry. And I, yeah. I also feel like um, we are, as an opera orchestra, we are so at the service of the stage. Every night, that's what we do. Yeah. And we can turn on a dime, given a, given a mistake and an aria, or our conductor's yeah. uh, <laughs> mistake. And so to be playing chamber music with each other in this small setting, not in the pit, not with stand lights, where hmm. we really hear each individual and we're at the service of more of each other. That's really mm -hmm. a change and it's, it's a beautiful thing, especially yeah. after all of this isolation and, yeah. and trouble that we've been having being furloughed. And, and I would also say that on any orchestra is a fragile thing that to come together and make that commitment and have um, the time it spent together making music is fragile and it can, it can be harmed by not being cared for. The no, orchestra very, itself. Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is the, the pity in all this and I hope that we come back as strong as we possibly can. But well, I do yeah. think it's certainly a silver lining of this time that that we have this opportunity to, to kind of zoom in on the individuals who make up this orchestra, who really are an incredible bunch of people and, and to spotlight their talents. And, and, and I think these opportunities to play chamber music are something that is really valuable for all of us. And I, I certainly hope we will continue to do it after we go back to playing opera also. That was good. good. So since most of you are actually playing the Mozart clarinet quintet, um, we were unfortunately not able to have the, the clarinet soloist um, in, in the quintet um, in today's talk. So I wanted to just kind of ask each of you, you know, since Mozart is such a staple composer in an opera house, I'm curious, uh, uh, what is your favorite Mozart opera or do you have a favorite Mozart opera? Huh. I don't have a favorite, I mean, you know, the cliche is, you know, that my favorite is the one that I'm happened to be playing at the time. Uh, if I had to pick a Desert Island Mozart opera, I guess it would be Don Giovanni. Uh, for no reason in particular, except that it is just so, has, it's so monumentally amazing and uh, it has such a wide range of expression. I think the comedies, you know, I guess if I... It has the cello obligato. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've played that so many times. And it's interesting, whenever I hear uh, broadcast recordings, I can barely make out that there's something going on. You know, it's like, all right, you know. But it's over in a flash. Um, yeah, I would say. Time I played that, this is a funny little story. I had just moved to New York, and somehow somebody knew me. And of all things, Ellie Ameling, the great Dutch soprano, was giving a recital at the Metropolitan Museum and wanted to sing that aria. And she said, oh, I think I'll get a cellist to play with me. And I got called to play this thing. That's the first time I ever played it. I was about 22 years old. I had no idea the context of how it, what it was in the opera or anything. But I do get to brag that I played it with Ellie Ameling. <laughs> that was great. And a lot of other amazing, amazing people. Too. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and, and it's got, what's gotten easier about it for me, of course, you know, I play it so many times, I don't have to worry about, you know, falling off the fingerboard anymore. But I, I have found that with some singers who shall remain nameless, I, you have to follow them all over the map rhythmically just to stay with them. So it's really a challenge and an exercise for the cellist to lock into what you can barely hear on the stage and try to play together with it. 
But I've noticed over the last, I would even say 10 years or so, that musicianship has gotten better <laughs> up there. And I don't find that the, that the rhythmic eccentricities are as pronounced as they used to be. And that's a good thing, I think. Uh, it certainly makes my job easier. And now I don't dread getting to it anymore like I used to. Oh, God, I have to figure out what to do now. Um, it could easier. also be a thank you to our terrific music staff. Perhaps they've just yes, been a little more. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Oh, but but we can talk about this with um, Dover Beach, too. And, and I, I do think that rhythm, when you're from your voice, rhythmic impulse and stuff is really a different experience somatically than when you're playing an instrument and you can speak to that the singer here when we talk about dover beach yeah no yeah we'll come to dover beach shortly oh yeah mary but I, I, oh, yeah just so, so that i yeah uh just out of curiosity do you have a favorite mozart opera or do you have a desert island mozart opera well, if I was going to be in a desert island, I would have to bring two of them. Two of them, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to bring a comedy and Don Giovanni. I'd have to bring Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni. And I would say, uh, if I had to drop one of them in the ocean on my way, I would have to drop Marriage of Figaro and keep Don Giovanni. <laughs> okay, so we have but, two Don Giovanni. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say, you know, um, isn't Cosi Bontuti the one he wrote? It was like in 1790, and the clarinet quintet is in 89, right? So yes, that's yeah, the one that's together. Yeah. And thank God he loved the clarinet. I mean, I thank know. God. And thank God he played the viola at the debut of um, <laughs> the, the clarinet quintet. Because I always think thank that God. maybe that variation. The viola variation, as as Jerry called it, the Jewish variation. It's um, I think it's the third variation in the last movement. That maybe he just improv that at the moment. I just always have a feeling that that may have been what what, what happened, what but I have no substantiation. <laughs> Wonderful. And Sylvia, I'm curious, do you have a favorite? You know, I, I hate to be boring, but mine's also Don Giovanni. But I, that was my opening night opera with the Met in the in 2000 with James Levine and Bryn Turple and uh, Renee Fleming. It has everything. That was and I my think, opening night one, too. I yeah, and I think like yeah. all second violinists know we're, we're all just one Don Giovanni away from a serious arm injury. It's so <laughs> athletic for the second fiddles. And I think our part's like 20 pages longer than the first violins. Like we're constantly just churning out all this stuff. It's very painful, but it's so exciting, you know, and when you we really get to the you know, the, the commandatory and that confrontation, everybody's going crazy and like, I love it. I love this job. It's so much fun, you know, but it, it's very painful. But I think in scope, it's, I also love abduction from Sorelio, honestly, because it feels kind of, I don't know, more primitive to me, but Don Giovanni has everything. It has all the, the, the things we look for. So I'm going to, I'm going to third that motion. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So before we come to Barbara, which will be shortly, I just wanted to try to give our listeners who are, yeah, like, you know, who are more chamber music aficionados, I wanted to give them a sense of your work performing operas and interacting with singers. And so my questions for you are sort of, how does it work really to be playing in a pit as part of an orchestra? And how does it feel when you have these tremendously powerful moments in opera when you are interacting and making music with a singer on stage in that way? And then my last question would just sort of be, are there any parallels for you between opera and chamber music? Lots, lots of parallels. I mean, it's music, you know, we're playing together with other musicians and you have to get it all to line up vertically as best you can and uh, be together and be, you know, well executed. Um, so, and you're listening skills they're they're a little different in the in an orchestra than playing chamber music let's say in chamber music let's say you're in a string quartet everybody besides being responsible for your part you're listening to your other three colleagues and listening with exquisite care for unbelievable detail um which makes string quartet life very difficult uh and i think i alluded to this earlier when you're in the orchestra a, a lot of that just gets lost in the wash and 
that kind of detail is, is less important, but we still uh, are listening like crazy down there. And that's, I think, one of the things that distinguishes our ensemble from uh, perhaps other great orchestras is that we are used to, and, and it's part of our job description, to listen, 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 listen all night long to the singers on the stage. And then to ourselves, we bring that same skill to bear while we're playing the orchestral moments. Um, so singers cannot guarantee that they'll sing something the same way every time. I mean, some are more consistent than others, but they're always at the mercy of, of how much breath they have, how well they feel that day. I'm married to a soprano, so I, you know, I know a little bit about what's hard about being up on that stage and why it is often to our, you know, our little instrumental minds, uh, you know, why, why can't she sing that uh, more in tune or, or more in time? And why do I have to do this? I get it. It's, it's hard for it, you know, they're wearing 40 pound costumes. They're sweating like crazy. Uh, and Tammy, you can probably speak to all of that stuff. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of sympathy for the, for the singers and we all do down in the pit. We really do. We all love our singers and we all are, as, as Mary said, we're there for them. That's an acquired skill that we, we all started with from our chamber music experience, perhaps. But as we get experience down in the orchestra and the pit, we develop our listening abilities times 10. It's unbelievable. And that's, I think, what makes us the Met Orchestra is, is this, this, that's one of the things that distinguishes us is this ability to listen and follow. And you have to follow a conductor and the singer may or may not follow the conductor and you have to decide who, whether to go with the conductor or to go with the singer or to go with the first trumpet player who may or may not heard what the singer did. Uh, we have to make choices on, on a hair trigger all night long and you can't stop concentrating. And that's sort of, that basically says it all. And the great moments, did you ask about what the great moments are like or the, when we get, there's this huge tide of emotion. Yes, like an ocean liner, I would imagine. Like, you know, it's yeah. like you're kind of in and, the... And again, I, I said this earlier, it's an experience you can't get playing chamber music or playing solo. You can only get it, and you can't get it playing in, in the Chicago Symphony. You can only get it at the Met and opera houses with great orchestras. And when, when the stars all come together, when you have a great cast, a great opera, a great conductor, our great orchestra, it's... There's nothing like it. It's really incredible. I would buy a ticket to come in here. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Well, I, I think the scope of the emotion, the depth of it is uh, beyond anything I ever experienced playing yeah. chamber music, chamber or even orchestral works. It's absolutely like a, you're, you're carried like a wave and then and people everybody feels that in the pit and there's moments where you know you look around and people are actually it sounds corny but people are in tears because you just experience like this tsunami of emotion and you've done it together as a unified whole and it's quite an experience that i've never had repeated anywhere else I agree. There's the unification of experience and of having hundreds of minds feel the same way at the same time and be concentrating towards the same effort. When you're unified emotionally, it's so powerful. And I think it's that kind of healing. That's part of what I miss. You know, the group experience of these emotions that bring you out of yourself and the study of that. I also think, as per Jerry's point, when you're making decisions all night and trying to, you know, right wrongs or unify people, um, that that. I think of it the same way in an exquisite sensitivity in terms of your listening, you know, the, the conductor can't always explain to you what to do. They may be fixing it, but if you don't know what he means, you have, you have to go on your, your really in-depth knowledge of what's happening as to the best solution in that moment. And there's something exciting and, and empowering about that, even though ideally nothing ever goes wrong and it rarely does, but you know, that, that there, there's an excitement in that, in that we're, we're kind of taking care of each other that way. Yeah. I'm sure you've all, been, been there where some every once in a while we get a guest conductor who you know eh, and something happens where uh 
we wait for the singer and the conductor doesn't. In other words, the conductor will give a cue and nobody plays because we could anticipate what the singer was doing. And we, the whole orchestra hears that and makes that adjustment. And it could be just a teeny little thing, but we make that adjustment. And it's awesome. It's really incredible. I never dreamed I'd play with it in a large, huge ensemble like us uh, that could do that. And I'm not, you know, it's not 100% of us, 100% of the time, but it's a large enough percentage of us who do that sort of thing enough of the time that it, it's actually the norm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's wow. great. Great. So I want to make sure I bring uh, uh, Tamara into the conversation. I just wanted to just, oh, before we talk about Dover Beach, just give a little bit of, um, sort of background since um, he um, he had a, such a strong relationship to the music division at the Library of Congress. Um, when we were first sort of discussing the programs, et cetera, I remember um, uh, we were so happy to see that many of them included works of Samuel Barber. And um, Barber was actually quite close to Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, um, who is the founder and the initial benefactor of concerts from the Library of Congress. And uh, the library actually owns the complete Samuel Barber collection of personal scores and the manuscripts for his compositions, including the opera Vanessa and Anthony Cleopatra. And uh, the Library of Congress, uh, we also have some of his personal letters, including a very touching letter to his family at the age of 10, where he's telling them he wanted to be a composer, which is very cute to see. Um, and yeah, you know, his work, um, 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 as we all know, um, as a composer was so deeply influenced by his experience of vocal music. Um, his aunt Louise Homer was a famous metropolitan opera star, a contralto during the Toscanini era, and Barber himself began his career as a singer. He was actually a baritone. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, he actually appeared at the library as both a singer and later as a pianist uh, when he accompanied uh, Leontine Price in her recital debut at the Library of Congress. So um, he, yes, and like, you know, th there's another connection, I guess, left between like the Met and um, and the library in the sense that both of both of these two artists, Leontine Price and Samuel Barber, had a decades long collaboration. And I would say one of the highlights of this collaboration was, of course, the opening of the new Met with Anthony and Cleopatra. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to just sort of say that there are a handful of archival recordings of him singing and even one where he sang and accompanied himself in leader actually quite brilliantly. Um, so I don't know if any of you have actually heard Barber's own performance of Dover Beach, but I just wanted to just play a very short sort of 30 second clip. So um, it's very rare that people have the chance to actually hear a composer actually sing a, the, the piece that he composed. And to me, it's, um, yeah, it's quite arresting to hear his performance of this work. So Tamara, it's really exciting for us to present you in this work, um, since one almost always hears Dover Beach sung by a man Although actually, when when although the work was actually premiered by the contralto Rose Bampton, another favorite of Toscanini, and I'm curious, um, is this the first time you've sung this piece? It is the first time I've sung it, and I mean, as you said, it was premiered by uh, Rose Brampton, so she she sang it in Philadelphia, and then again the following year in New York City. So I think you know Barber wrote this and was very comfortable with the lush rich depth of a yes, <laughs> contralto yes. sort of voice so i'd like to think that's actually you know what how he meant it to be performed but then of course because uh because he was a singer and very interested in performing his own work uh, i think then it uh, became got shuffled to be a baritone piece but i think you know of course i'm not um the most you know it, i don't have the most kind of objective opinion on that because i'm biased to uh, my own sound but i'm I'm glad to be able to perform it here. And, you know, certainly it's nice to have 
both to be able to hear it in different ways and and experience the piece with different sort of textures of sound, I think is is a really nice luxury. So I'm glad to be singing it here. Oh, well, wonderful. Yeah. I'm curious, um, is there, Yela, from your perspective as a mezzo, yeah, you know, is there anything that is achieved differently, I guess you could say vocally speaking, for a woman as opposed to a man singing the role? You know, or I. I I guess I, I wouldn't say specifically for a woman as much as just like the different texture in sound, you know, like my sound is certainly different from other another soloist. So I guess I think of it more uh, individually for myself and and that I I am looking forward to bringing my own sound and my own feeling to this piece, you know, uh, so so in that way, I'm yeah just pleased to get to work with it. Oh, wonderful. Well, yeah, I i mean, I've actually have never heard it sung by a mezzo-soprano or a contralto, and I'm so looking forward to hearing your performance of it. Yeah, like, I, I, like, seeing, like, your performances on video and live, and so we're, like, I think that we're in for quite a treat. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I have another question, both for you, Tamara, and for the quartet. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Barber was quoted in a book once uh, where um, where he was talking about Dover Beach, and I'm sort of paraphrasing at the moment, but he said that Dover Beach is a very difficult piece because nobody is boss, so to speak, not the singer or the quartet, it's chamber music. And so, yeah, for sort of each of you, what do you say on this and how do you view this piece in the context of the other chamber repertoire on the program? Um, if I could say, you know, we were talking before about the differences or parallels between the operatic repertoire and and the orchestra being in the pit versus this chamber music. And I think in the main difference is there's not a conductor leading us and in that each of us become the conductor and each of us work together to present what it is that we think is important in the piece and the, you know, the places to bring out or the textures that we feel are are most important to emphasize in certain areas. and. I think, you know, one of the benefits that I had was what I was a singer at the Lindemann Young Artist Program and in my training. And so for the for the year, I would be at the Met. But then each summer during that time, I was able to go to the um, Marlboro uh, Music Festival in Vermont, the wonderful chamber music festival in Vermont each summer. So I felt like I was able to really have this well-balanced sort of education where I was just so immersed in opera all year long. And then in the summer, was just able to go into this completely other world where we were all in charge and we weren't looking to a conductor to tell us how they wanted to shape a certain place, but each of us as one in the ensemble had something to say about a piece and something to bring. And I think that that, that was a gift that I was given in my training, but something that, that I look forward to when I do chamber music because it really is a, a conversation, you know, amongst all of the players. Um, and and that's something that you just can't have in a full uh, in a in a full huge opera production, you know. I also think there's a quality about Dover Beach that the voice is actually part of the texture. Mm -hmm. So often, even in chamber music, the voice is is set apart as a melodic um, device, kind of. And in Dover Beach, you're, it's all just in there in that watery mix. And that I think is really outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think- Chamber music. Exactly. I feel like the voice here just sort of lends text to the things that the orchestras or that the chamber players are already saying, you know, as the orchestra, as the waves are sort of undulating in that opening phrase, then suddenly you have this calm voice coming in saying the sea is calm tonight and the orchestra I mean, or the the chamber players have already set that up and have made that picture and then as the singer you just get to lend a little shimmer of text to what's already being displayed you know and i think that happens several times throughout you know where the where the uh instrumentalists are playing already the thing that then i get to add just another little layer with uh, that bit of text to what's what's being shown and it's also very, very romantic. The piece to me is is very, very emotional, and and it has that. Um, uh, it's Victorian almost in its roman romanticism, and I think that the voice just being in in that mix is so powerful. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for those insights. So, so much for those insights on Dover Beach. So um, I just wanted to just um, thank you. And I just want to just, just sort of say that although there are currently, of course, no opera performances, the Met Orchestra musicians have still obviously been very busy and will also give another concert for us in June in a concert highlighting Mozart's epic Grand Partita. During their time away from the opera house, they have been reaching out to their communities and audiences and fellow musicians through virtual live and educational programming. And I encourage our listeners to check out their website, metorchestramusicians.org and check out their various initiatives, their grants, concerts, and additional content highlighting the members of this amazing ensemble. I myself have enjoyed the various funny and heartwarming short videos about the musicians and their families. Uh, seeing the totality of what these musicians do both on and off the stage is very inspiring to witness. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Tamara and Julia, Sylvia, Mary and Jerry. And I just wanted to just see if, if there's anything uh, you would like to sort of say in closing. Well, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Demi. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, as um, because I, I am not part of the orchestra, but just a guest on this uh, occasion, but just bravi to all of you for the way that you've handled this time. I mean, I think it's really wonderful to see these concerts that you're putting together and the way that you are uh, just making the best out of this situation that is is very difficult. Um, and then this is sort of funny, as a side note, it was mentioned earlier that in the orchestra, many times you're listening to the voice and trying to mimic what you hear as far as like a legato line or things like that. and. I was a violist growing up and so much of the time as a singer, I think about how to play this as a violist. You know, when I'm singing, I'm thinking, oh, I want that whole thing as a down bow or this is, you know, like a all on one bow or I really, really want to dig into the bow here. So it's funny the way these things go back and forth. But. It's very funny. You know, I, <laughs> I uh, would, all, would, if I encounter a singer with exceptionally good rhythm, uh, the first question I say, wow, you really, you really uh, what instrument do you play? <laughs> but you know, well, there's there's a lot of precedent. Like um, Judy Blagan played was a violin, was a double major at Curtis. She played violin mm -hmm. and she was a soprano, of course. Well, I was yeah. cer certainly not at that level. I'm con right now. I could yeah. probably play and, like that. Tucka tucka stop stop. Tucka yeah. tucka stop stop. <laughs> and don't forget, Lorraine Hunt Lieberman was a. Viola. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The greatest of them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we just featured Eric Owens as the host of our January Spotlight Series concert, and he was an oboist, I learned. That's right. So, that's right. Really yeah. But um, yeah. I just want to say a big thank you to Tammy for joining us in, these, in this concert and some other mm -hmm. performances this year, and, and to Kazim and the whole team at the Library of Congress. We're so grateful to you for including our orchestra in your programs and for, for continuing this series. Um, I think it's really wonderful, and, and we're very grateful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And we're glad to have you as well. Well, thank you very much to everyone. And we all look forward to seeing this concert coming up on April or that's coming up in April. Thank you very much.